This is Dr. Roger Green in his Church History course on the Reformation to the Present. This is Lecture Number 1, The Introduction, The Syllabus. Very thoroughly with you so that you know exactly what you need to do for this course um, and what's exactly what's expected and everything. So we're going to go over that syllabus pretty carefully. Um, uh, for about the first month of the course, I should just say this. You'll see this in the taping. I, mean, I had some eye surgery this summer, so I'm waiting to get my glasses. I have to wait about a month to do it. But in the meantime, I need these to read. So I'm afraid um, I've got to be off and on with the glasses a little bit, um, which I won't have to do when I'm able to get my other glasses. So, But uh, when they corrected, you know, when they t uh, I had cataract surgery, and when they took care of that, they... It, it ruined my ability to read without glasses, so there you are. So, so we'll be switching on and off a little bit for the first month or so, but not after that, I hope. So, Okay, let's pray, and then we'll start. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do stop to turn our hearts and attention and our minds to you at the beginning of this semester. We are indeed grateful that by your grace you have granted us the vocation of student, being students, and we're grateful for that because we know that a lot of people uh, would want to be in our, in our place. And a lot of people would like to be able to study today and aren't able to do, to do that for one reason or another. But by your grace, you've given us this vocation. And we pray that we will be faithful to that vocation and that we will be determined to be good students one of another during this course. We give you thanks for the full and complete revelation of yourself in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we give thanks for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our own personal lives, but also in our corporate life, to the fact that we are your children, about your business, and we're grateful for that. So we have so many things to be thankful for today. We give you thanks for this course. We thank you for the kind of unfolding of Christian theology and Christian doctrine um, as we look at this course and the people and the events uh, and the ideas that shape that. We recognize that this is a course about your church, about the body of Christ here on earth that bears witness to the kingdom. And so we pray that as we go through the course, we might keep asking ourselves, what is our place in this church? What is our place in this body of Christ? Where do we fit? So we pray that you will help us be with us in our endeavors together as we learn together in this course, as we begin this semester this day. And we pray these things gladly in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, um, it's going to be easy for me to remember the names here, but uh, I'd like you to do five things for me on, this, on, this, on these cards, if you will. So we just pass those cards around. I think there's enough there, right there. Um, do we have enough? We need one more. Just pass that back. Oh, you have enough? Oh, great. Okay. If you just put last name, first name, and then freshman, sophomore, junior, senior for me, that would be great. And then, um, and then your hometown. I'm kind of interested in where you're from. And uh, if that takes some explanation, that's fine. And uh, what your major is. And if you're a double major. I'm even interested if, you're, if you have a minor, too. Um, the most important thing is, why did you take this course? What was it about the course that kind of struck your interest? Was it... Was it um, Christianity Reformation to the present? You've always wanted to study that period of time. Um, was it that you needed some theology course? Um, you love to study at 9, 10 in the mornings. Um, I don't know, but what compelled you? So if you take a few minutes just to do that, that's going to be really helpful to me. Yes, we are going to go over the syllabus very carefully so that you know exactly what's, uh, what we're doing in the course. Great. Thank you. And um, that, that's my intention today, and then we, we'll start lecturing on Friday. Uh, so I'm not uh, intending to insult your intelligence by reading some of this material. It's just that as I read it, it reminds me of um, things that I need to say about the course. And it reminds me of kind of a, being able to expand on some, some things here. So um, there's the material up on the right-hand side, my office, extension number, email, office hours. 
Um, but I really like to meet other than office hours. But you can meet me during office hours, that's fine. But um, I'm glad to meet for lunch. I'm glad to meet you know, a couple of you even for lunch and that at various times. So you don't need to be uh, held to those office hours. It's just that, that there they are kind of for your convenience. So, Okay, Christianity Reformation to the present. The course is designed to give the student insight into the nature and development of the basic beliefs of the historic Christian community. In this light, an attempt will be made to understand the central theological affirmations of the historic Orthodox faith and deviations from those affirmations. Special attention will be given to the area of consensus and agreement among the various branches and ecclesiastical traditions within Christianity, as well as to various issues over which the church is divided. We're not going to kind of ignore those issues over which the church has found division and uh, can't seem to get um, their act together. The course will concentrate heavily upon the vital interrelationship between history and theology, and especially the relationship between historical events both within and without the church and the formulation of Christian doctrine. Beginning with Matthew 16, 15, in which Jesus asked the very important question of his disciples, who do you say that I am? And continuing to the present day, dogma and doctrine have been central to the Christian faith. The first Christian proclamation or confession by Peter in response to that question, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, demonstrated at the outset of the gospel the need for doctrine. And this need has continued throughout the life of the church. The counterpart to this course, which is 305, Development of Christian Thought, examines specifically the creeds and doctrines that arose during the first seven ecumenical councils of the church. This course, while examining some creeds, emphasizes how doctrines have developed since the 16th century in a much more divergent church tradition than existed in the early church. It is part of the task of this course to examine, in the context of both sacred and secular history, the nature, function, and formulation of Christian theology. This will be done primarily through looking at the Protestant tradition. As the authors of our textbook have stated, the pattern of Protestant theological development has been one of recurrent reinterpretation of Christian faith in response to new needs and situations, of reaction and revival in the midst of fundamental continuity. Theological developments within Roman Catholic thought will also be studied in this course, and some attention will be given to the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Uh, let me stop there for just a minute. Um, this is, as I mentioned, this is a course in a, with a Protestant understanding of the formulation of doctrine. Some people think that you can just read the New Testament or the Old Testament and the New Testament and then not have to talk about theology. But actually, theology was embedded in the, in the biblical text. And so the, the example I give is that Matthew text where Jesus said, who do people say that I am? In a sense, that's a theological question. And Peter's response was a theological statement. It was a cre in a sense, it was a creedal statement. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, the very natural thing to ask after that is, what does all of that mean? when he said that, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's what this course is going to try to, try to develop from biblical text. We're going to try to understand how theology, how doctrine gets developed, gets shaped, gets formulated in the ways in which it does. Um, I mentioned right here at the outset, this, we're going to look at this mainly through Protestant glasses. Um, the Protestant approach to theology is an approach that shows, um, hello, Jesse. Are you Jesse? Yeah. Oh, bless your heart, Jesse. Come and join us. Uh, we'll have you fill out a card when you, before you leave. Um, and Oh, and you need a syllabus, too. Yeah, there you go. We're just going over that syllabus to make sure we know what we're doing here, Jesse. Um, so the Protestant approach to all of this is, to theology, is that theology needs to be continually interpreted in every generation. Theology is not something static. It's not something that you kind of have in a box. It needs to be re-understood for every single generation. It needs to be, it needs to be reinterpreted for every generation. So that's, that's the kind of the Protestant way, and that's what we'll be doing in this course, and seeing how that happened from the 16th century to the 21st century. So. Now, um, if you look at that last paragraph, special attention will be given to the important people, the important ideas, and the important events that have shaped Christian orthodoxy from the Reformation to the present. In giving attention to these areas, the course is designed to provide the student with necessary insights and resources for pursuing the vital disciplines that shed light on the development of Christian thought. 
there's three words that I just want to point out. Important idea, uh, important people, important ideas, important events. That's what this course is all about. You get the right people with the right ideas and you have the right events and something happens in the history of the church. Sometimes it's kind of unexplainable. But you get, for example, a Martin Luther with his ideas and events that revolved around his life and you've got the Reformation kind of exploding under Luther, beginning with Luther. So, um, so let's watch for that in the lectures and your readings and so forth, important ideas, important events, important people. We mentioned that the counterpart to this course is the Development of Christian Thought course. We begin in that course with the New Testament Church. We end with the Reformation. In that course, the Reformation is studied through the life and theology of Martin Luther. This course begins with the Reformation, and in this course, the Reformation is studied through the life and theology of John Calvin. Because the Reformation is so central to the development of Christian thought, it is necessary to study the Reformation in both courses. Students who take both courses have the opportunity to study both Martin Luther and John Calvin. So I only say that because in the past, we're a little down in numbers. There's only eight of us registered for this course, only eight of you registered. And that's down in numbers certainly from the past when we've had probably 25, 30 for the course. And it was usually, it was not unusual that I had, had students in the course that had taken the 305 course and wanted to take the 306 course as kind of a, you know, filling out, filling out the time. Um, so that's why I developed this process so that in that course I do Martin Luther and in this course I do John Calvin. Um, I did it for that reason. So while we'll be talking about Luther, lecturing on Luther, our main emphasis when it comes to the Reformation is going to be on Calvin. So, Okay, class three classroom lectures each week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Class discussion is certainly uh, encouraged during the, during the lectures, and some time will be set aside before each examination to discuss questions that you have as a result of your study of the textbooks, and we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. There are four required texts. Uh, first of all, Donald Dayton's Discovering an Evangelical Heritage. Um, this text is about the last one that you read. I only put these in kind of alphabetical order here, but um, Donald Dayton is a scholar of American religious history, reminds a reader of the heritage, heritage of evangelicalism in the 19th century, especially the social ministry of evangelicalism at that time. It's a challenge for evangelicals to remember their theological social heritage, apply that memory to the life of the church today. That's going to be when we're studying uh, uh, fundamentalism and evangelicalism. So, the Dillenberger text, uh, Dillenberger and and, uh, and Welch text is um, two outstanding scholars. I, it's still hard to find a text that can beat this. If you want to know the important people, the important ideas, and the important events, this is still a great text for that. This is our primary text. This is where you're going to get the kind of the heart of the matter in terms of the 16th century on to the to the present. Mark Knowles' Turning Points, um, subtitle of this text, aptly describes the intention of the text, decisive moments in the history of Christianity. Um, have any of you read this text by any chance? It's a pretty popular text, but I wonder. Uh, Mark Knoll, one of the most astute historians in the academic world today, evangelical Christian, has described some of the most salient moments in the life of the church. The entire text obviously is worth your attention. Our basic readings come from the second half of the book. And Mark Knoll will be on campus this semester lecturing, so we'll hear Mark Knoll. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. I think we should be okay. Uh, if you don't mind bringing it in, um, we'll arrange a time to bring it in or come to my office so I can look at the edition I've got. And I'll look at your edition just to make sure. But I think you should be fine. Yeah. And then here's a book that you may not be familiar with um, by Randall Zachman. It's a fairly new book, John Calvin is Teacher, Pastor, Theologian. Um, this book is an excellent study of Calvin. It's not the only one. There's t tons of biographies of John Calvin, tons of writings on John Calvin, obviously. Um, but what I have done is um, uh, so that this book, I, I don't know, so make it kind of easier to read for you. If you look at the, um, the end of the syllabus, uh, the, is it the first appendix? I think it is the first appendix. Uh, no, it's appendix number two on page 11. So if you just turn to page 11 for a minute, what I've done there is I've given you a study sheet for this text. 
um, to make it more understandable in terms of what you need to be looking at and so forth. So take note of the development of his institutes. We'll talk about that when we're lecturing as well. Take note of the various theological terms in the book. Take note of the important places in the life of John Calvin, especially Geneva and Strasbourg. We'll be talking about other places as we lecture. But, and then now, the question is, because there's so many names mentioned in the book, what about, what about people? Who are the people I really need to know from this text? These are the people that you need to know. So um, if it would help you, this is not something you hand in. This is just something for your own study. So as you're reading that text, if it would help you to keep this by your side as you read the text, all well and good. Um, so that's why I give it to you there. So those are the four texts of the course, and, uh, and um, that's what we're going to be zeroing in on. All right, on page three, um, let's talk about the kind of the requirements of the course. Um, we love examinations. Yeah, Jesse? Yes. Are there any of those that we won't be getting to until later so that maybe I can get them the time? Yes, the, especially the date and text would be near the end. Um, the Calvin text, the, the, the other three, we do kind of have you reading every week um, selection, but the date and text isn't until the end of the course. Yeah, sure. We love exams. They, uh, we shouldn't call them examinations. We should call them opportunities, shouldn't we? So we call them, there are, here's some opportunities you're going to have. Monday, September 30th, first hour exam. Monday, October 28th, second hour exam. And Tuesday, December 18th is the final exam. Um, there are some discussion groups, participation we'll be talking about. But OK, here's three things about the exams you need to know. Um, you shouldn't miss these exams except for extreme emergencies. So in the event you do miss the first or second hour exam, you need to take a makeup exam. And I don't give makeup exams until the morning of reading day. So you don't want to miss this, these exams, not because you love them, but just because you don't want to, you don't want to be taking makeup exam on reading day. Now, that's extreme. Of course, if you have an extreme emergency, that wouldn't count. And we'll, you know, I'm here to help. Um, it's a college policy that the individual professor may not for any reason allow the student to take a final exam at any, any time other than that designated by the registrar. So please do not ask me for permission. I don't have the authority to reschedule the final examination. So I have no authority to reschedule that. So it's just you have to take it when it's, when it's given. So, um, And if you have three final exams scheduled for one day, may petition to take one of those exams at another time during final examination week. However, the instructor will allow the final examination to be given another time under these circumstances only if the student requests this by Friday, September 6th. So let me just say that not all faculty believe in this, um, in this policy. Um, I think if you have three exams in a day, you should just take them. That's life, you know. But, but um, it's a college policy, and I don't mind abiding by it if I hear from you by September 6th. So uh, you'll, you'll know by that time what your final exam schedule is in all your classes. And if you do have three final exams scheduled, for, uh, you, you, know, you can get excused from one of them. Um, Reading assignments divided in textbook assignments. We'll see that in a few minutes for each week. Each student is expected to read the assigned materials. Now, here's something you want to take note of. Where biblical passages are referred to in the texts of the readings, students are expected to read and understand the biblical texts as well as the immediate context of those texts. So if you're reading um, and, and it's talking about, I don't know, Ephesians 1, you need to take a look at Ephesians 1 and see what is there. And also, what's the context? What is being talked about in Ephesians 1? So you need to keep your Bible at hand as you're reading your texts. Um, so that's going to be important. And of course, you're encouraged to read other books and articles that will assist you in your understanding of the course. Questions will be taken from the readings as well as class lectures. Major weight of the course is on examination, so you need to master the reading material. Now, here's something that um, I take a bit of time to, to talk about, um, because students don't uh, maybe quite get this. So term papers. So here's the deal on term papers. The submission of a term paper is optional for those who wish extra credit, but it is a requirement for an A or an A minus grade in this course. The highest grade that a student may earn in this course without a paper is a B plus. The writing of the paper should be governed by the guidelines for writing research papers posted on Blackboard. Also what I did was I, yeah, I don't want you to look at it now because we want to go through the syllabus, but um, 
Here's those guidelines in hard copy. Let me start right here, Grant, if you would pass that over that way. These are the guidelines in hard copy, and these are the guidelines that I use for all of my courses. There's four there, if you'll just pass those. These are the guidelines I use for all of my courses for writing assignments. So you want to go by these guidelines if you're thinking of writing a paper. So if you just kind of keep that with you, and also we'll make those available on Blackboard as well. So. Um, the instructor will continue to use, so here's the grading system. The paper might be graded superior. Ten points are added to your final grade average. So that's your final grade average. That's good. Ten points added to your final grade average. That's a good thing. So say your final grade average is 82. You're going to 10 points, 92. A superior paper would normally be sufficient to advance a student from one grade to the next higher grade. It's understood that the superior paper would be the exception rather than the rule, since it would display a high degree of excellence in the area of thought and expression. Occasionally, a student will receive a 1 minus, and you will receive 8 points. Then the paper might be deemed to be an acceptable paper. Two, four points will be added to the student's final grade average. So the acceptable paper will normally be sufficient to push a student sitting on the borderline between two grades into the next higher grade category. Occasionally, I'll give a 2 plus in which 6 points are added or a 2 minus in which 2 points are added. Now, if you hand in a paper and it's unacceptable, you get a 3 in the paper, it's not acceptable, no points are added to your final grade average. But it should be noted that the unacceptable paper cannot help a student's final grade average. But the student writing an unacceptable paper cannot receive above a B plus for the course. Likewise, the unacceptable paper will not lower a student's final grade average in that the papers were optional, not a requirement for the course. So if the paper's unacceptable, it's like you didn't write one. So it's like you didn't write one, so you can't get, get above a B plus for the course. But, but it can't hurt you. Um, so if it's unacceptable, it's not going to detract from your grade. So I encourage you to write a paper. Um, I really think you know it's good for you. Um, you can all do this. Um, you've got about 12 weeks. Um, so I really, really think you should. Paper should be a minimum of 10 pages of text, not counting the cover page and notes bibliography. Double space, 10 font. Um, minimum of eight books and or articles used in the writing of the paper with sufficient end note evidence at the end of the paper. These sources were essential in the writing of the paper. The instructor would be grading the paper on form and content. This is based on the fact that the way one expresses himself or herself is as important as what he or she says. I was an English major at Temple University, so once you're an English major, you're always an English major. So the research for the paper must be integrated with the student's own thinking about the value of the topic in relation to contemporary Christian experience. The student's number, rather than his or her name, should appear on the first page of the paper. Um, because if you don't come and talk with me about the paper, now lots of people do. They want to talk with me about the paper. They want me to read a draft, which I'm glad to do. <coughs> so naturally, I'm going to know who wrote the paper. But if you hand in your paper and you haven't talked with me about it, the only thing that's going to be on that paper is your student ID number. So that when I grade it, I don't know whose papers I'm grading. I can really be objective in the grading of the paper when I do that. So we'll talk a lot about this during the course, so you don't need to kind of get all this now. The paper is due on Wednesday, December 4th at the class hour, and generally I don't accept late papers. If, the, if it is late, one full grade is deducted for every day the paper is late. Okay, here are your subjects. <clears throat> Martin Luther and the Sacraments, Developments in Roman Catholic Theology in the 19th Century, Karl Barth's Doctrine of Election, and Women in Le Leadership in the Church since the Reformation. So Martin Luther and the Sacraments, see we're not talking too much about Luther in the course. This would give you a chance to really develop a, uh, a, a, some thinking from Luther. Roman Catholic theology, 19th century, Karl Barth, 20th century, uh, very important, or women in leadership in the church since the Reformation. And usually when students do this one, they pick maybe two or three women in the history of the church who have been very important, and what they do is compare and contrast, and I can help you with that. <clears throat> now notice I say, should students wish the instructor to read first drafts of optional papers, these drafts must be given to the instructor two weeks before the date, due date for these papers. I'm always glad to read first drafts, and I can help you a lot if you hand me a first draft. Um, the problem was a few years ago, I started having students hand me the first draft the night before the paper was due. This is not a good thing. Um, I couldn't really help them that late. Um, so what I say now is, two weeks before the paper's due, 
you hand me your paper, I'll read your draft, and I'll help you a lot with that paper. So I'll encourage you to do this, but let's see how we do. Um, let me stop there for just a minute. Is this understandable to everyone? It's optional. Don't have to do it. If you don't do it and get 100 in all three exams, you'll still get a B plus for the course. So it's, yeah. We will be covering them somewhat in the course. This gives you a chance to dig in further. So for example, in the course under C, we talk about Karl Barth. What we do with Karl Barth is talk about his life, his ministry, but also we, we take five theological areas that were so very important to him. Um, this is going to give you a chance to get deeper into his theology. So yeah, so we do cover these, but not the way you would in a paper. Yeah. So, we understand this about the papers. I encourage you to do a paper if you started today. It'll be one page a week. You can do this, one page a week. It's 10 pages long, one page a week. This is doable. So, um, get started today and then you're done. There's this, by the way, this has nothing to do with anything, which is often the case in my life um, or in the course. I, I, there's a student here who will go unnamed because he might not want me to tell his name, but there's a student here who, very disciplined, very disciplined. What he does is, he gets all of his courses and everything, sees all the papers he's got to write. He writes all of his papers in the first three weeks of the course, he, courses of the semester. He just decides he doesn't want to be under pressure at the end of the semester to be writing papers. He'd rather, he'd rather front load the, the, the hard work and do it and, and, and write them, and then they're basically done. That's a, that's a good idea, you know? Isn't that a good, are you rejoicing in that idea? or? But I just thought I'd kind of share it with you. Okay, discussion groups. Okay, on some Fridays, the instructor will meet with the students to discuss the reading material for the course. Special attention will be given to pertinent questions and theological problems that arise as a result of the reading and or the lectures of the class. Active involvement by students in these discussion groups is encouraged, may help a student's grade in the course. Before each discussion group, uh, students will be selected to bring questions and observations um, from the textbooks to the class. The grade for participation in the discussion groups is 10% of the final grade. Students will hand in a hard copy of two or three questions observations from the textbooks to the instructor on the Wednesday before each Friday discussion group. If a student has to miss a discussion group, the questions must be given to the instructor at the next class period. All right, now let me just, um, I don't have to choose students. I had to, do, I had to make choices when we had 25 or 30 in class, but I don't have to when there's just eight of us. <clears throat> so what will happen is, before each exam, we'll have two discussion groups, uh, two discussion times on two Fridays. <clears throat> we have them over at the lion's den. So you can get breakfast and bring in a full breakfast if you want to in the lion's den and uh, bring all your texts. And the Wednesday before each of those Fridays, you'll hand me two or three questions from the textbook readings up till that time, uh, printed out so I can read them. Uh, do any of you have eight o'clock classes? I have an eight o'clock class, just an eight o'clock class. So the others of you don't have eight o'clock classes. So you can go right from your dorm to get breakfast and bring breakfast in to the, uh, to the lion's den and, uh, and then we'll meet you there and that's where we spend our hour. I like that because it gets us away from lecturing so it gets us away from kind of the formality of the classroom. And I also like it because it's a different way of learning. It, it gets you into the text, gets you discussing the text, um, gets you asking questions about the text and discussing with each other about the text. So, so a couple Fridays before, and we'll, we'll keep you up to date on when this will, this will be happening. So. so that's the discussion group. Okay, class attendance. Gordon College believes, I decided to put this in kind of theological language. So I said, Gordon College believes, so, and I believe, I believe too, and you believe, I know. Gordon College believes that many of the values to be secured during the college period cannot be measured adequately or accurately only through written examinations. Among those values are those received through participation in the activities of the classroom and of discussion groups. Consequently, regular attendance and active involvement in classes and discussion groups are essential elements of the learning process. With privilege comes responsibility, so act, attitude, 
participation and involvement. Um, excessive absences, more than four unexcused absences may affect a student's grade. One point would be deducted from the student's final grade average for each unexcused absence beyond four. If the student misses a discussion group, that will count as two unexcused absences. Okay. All, and then all school-sponsored activities, you know this, you're all up, you know, field trips, athletic events, concerts, drama tours that may require your missing class must be cleared with the professor in the first two weeks of the course. Okay, here's the deal on, on um, class attendance. I am a Neanderthal when it comes to class attendance. I actually believe that college students ought to go to class. Now, I don't know where I got this from. I don't know why I would think this. I don't know why I would believe this. I, why do I, why, why would I think that college students ought to go to class? But I actually think you should go to class. I actually think you should go to all your classes. And so, um, so I think you should come to this class. I, am, I may be the only upper division professor that you have that actually takes attendance. I mean, I know some of them don't, so I actually actually take attendance. Now, in this class, it's easy. There's eight of us, so that takes about two seconds. It also gets me to know your names. But um, So, four unexcused absences. If you miss a discussion group, that's two unexcused absences just for that group. So you want to be sure to come to those. And of course, if, if you have excused absences, that's fine. So. Okay, and you know about course accommodation, committed to assisting students with documented disabilities, and a um, student with a disability needs to meet with a staff person from the Academic Support Center and then deliver to me the faculty notification form. Um, so um, you're, you're familiar with that. So. Okay, now let's talk about the outline here. Um, I lecture by uh, title and, and, and uh, number and title of the lecture. Um, I'll be, I still have some introductory things I mentioned on Friday, but then we'll be able to start on Friday with lecture one. So that's how I do it. In the best of all worlds, starting on the week of September 2nd, those readings, if you can do those readings before the lecture, that's the best of all worlds. Um, but on Monday, there's no class. Uh, it's Labor Day, so we'll meet on Friday. A couple more discuss, a couple more kind of introductory things I do, and then I start lecturing lecture one on Friday. Monday is Labor Day, so there's no class on Monday. So next week's a quick week, just the Wednesday and Friday. So if you can have those things read, that's just helpful to you. But obviously, you don't have to have these things read until the final, until the first hour exam. So, also for most of the weeks, I give suggested readings. So here I'm suggesting Richard McBride's book on Catholicism. Um, that's not for you to read. Those are just suggestions. Those are just kind of to put in your library. Uh, for the future, you know, or to add to your library and read them for summer reading or something. Or they may help you for papers. If you're doing a paper on Catholicism in the 19th century, that book could be a help. So there's the difference between the readings that you're doing and the suggested readings, which are not, you don't have to read that. And that goes right down the line. Um, there it is. Um, if you turn over to the next page, seven, then it talks, there's the first hour examination. And then it keeps going. Thursday and Friday um, is, um, is uh, quad exam time, so we don't have classes on the Friday. Yeah, Jesse? Well, you can read them throughout the week. If you have them read by Monday, that's just going to help you in terms of your reading because you know, read, read, read. I mean, that's the nature of the college life. Um, so, um, and some of these texts can be a little difficult, like the text on Calvin. So, but if you want to read them throughout the week, that's fine. Um, what, what you need to have them done is, you need to have those readings done by the time the discussion groups meet, for sure. Um, and I'll be talking about discussion groups as we as the course goes along, so yeah. But if you can read ahead, that's just going to help you. If you can keep ahead in the reading, that's going to be helpful. Okay, and then it goes on. The second hour exam is is the twenty eighth. There uh, now, if you look at page eight, uh, and what is um, what is highlighted on page eight, please note um, here's an here's an out of uh, class um, assignment that you, I'm asking you to do. Choose two lectures to attend during the conference sponsored by the church, uh, the Center for Faith and Inquiry, which is November 14 through 16. The conference is entitled Protestantism, a reflection in advance of, um, of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, 1517 to 2017. 
uh, information will be forthcoming. Now, here's a couple of reasons I do that. Out of, so you've got two out-of-class assignments, two lectures. Each lecture will be an hour and a half. So that'll be three hours. I do this for two reasons. Number one, um, Gordon is really very good about, about allowing us to um, uh, go to conferences or speak at conferences or read papers. Or, and um, and, and I, you know, I try to really be careful of that. Actually, the first time I do that, the first time I'm going to be away, it comes up pretty quick. And I'll let you know about that. And when I'm away, um, I, I don't have a guest lecturer come in or something like that. So you know, we're, we just don't meet for classes. So the first reason I did that is because that's a good way to kind of make up for a couple class days. Um, but the second reason I do it is because there are going to be some outstanding internationally known speakers here for that conference. And I'd love for you to be exposed to those speakers. So it both, it, it both makes up the class time a bit. But also it exposes you, and one of them is Noel, uh, that we've already mentioned in terms of reading his, his textbook. Um, so it, it also is going to expose you to some great lecturers. So it, it, it kind of accomplishes two things. Um, so I'm just, it's just wonderful that that conference happens to be happening uh, during, this, uh, during this semester. And then there's a Thanksgiving recess, and then the conclusion to the course, and then um, uh, the final exam is scheduled, and, and here's Dietrich Bonhoeffer here, whom we will be talking about in the course. Oh, you know what I might just take note of, uh, as long as I talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Just look on page 8 for just a minute, will you? Go back to page 8. Um, two of the days, Monday, December 2nd, and, and Wednesday, December 4th, on those, on those two days, we are showing, we're not lecturing on those two days, we're here in this classroom, but we show a wonderful... Um, video on Dietrich Bonhoeffer called Dietrich Bonhoeffer Memories and Perspectives. And that happens, it usually kind of hits the time we're lecturing on Bonhoeffer. I may have already lectured on him if I'm ahead of my lectures, but that's fine. But that is, th these two, this video is a wonderful video on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So we're going to be learning, I hope, quite a bit about Bonhoeffer in the course. Okay, if you look at uh, page 10. The question people are always asking, you know, what's on the exam? So what I've done for each exam is I've told you what's on the exam, the material covered on the exam, in terms of the lectures, in terms of the reading, and, um, oh, I meant to point out, you do have one article earlier on that you have to read, and that's in the assignments anyway, so I'll pass that article so you'll have it. Um, it's a great article. It's an article entitled The Intellectual Appeal of the Reformation. So, so when it's time to read that, you've, you've got it now. So you'll be able just to read it and have it. And we'll discuss this in one of our discussion groups. Second hour exam, same thing in terms of uh, what's on the exam or what kind of exam it is. And the third hour exam, or the final exam rather, is what's materials covered for the third hour exam. Okay, you've got your study sheet there. And then if you just turn to the outline here, I'm watching my time because Ted and I have to have to scoot out of here early today and get robed up for the, for the convocation. So I, I've got to let you go in a few minutes here so we can get ready for that. But if you just look on page 12, I lecture by lecture number and title and by outline. So in order to make your life a little bit easier, this is the outline that I'll be using for the lectures from day one. So if you, have, if you brought with you to class um, this outline, uh, the syllabus with this outline, I think it could really be helpful to you because this is the outline that, that I use to lecture. Some of them are more um, like page 13, the lecture uh, six. Some of them are a little more developed than others, but basically, you know, it's just a basic outline of what we're doing in the class. So I hope that will help you um, in the, as you go through the course. All right, um, questions. You have any questions about this course, about what's, what we're doing, why we're doing it? It's Reformation to the Present. Um, it's exciting time in church history. It's exciting time in the development of theology. It is also the development of theology has a lot to do with your personal lives. Um, so, and, um, and the course is a little bit of a mixture of lectures, but then on two Fridays before each exam, we'll be in the lion's den and we'll be having breakfast together and we'll be talking about the material and so forth. So it's, it's a, little bit of a little bit of a mixture of lectures and discussions. Um, any questions that you have at all? 
we will uh, start lecturing on Friday. We'll give some I got some introductory remarks I want to make about studying theology. And then we'll be able to get into the first lecture. And then on Monday, no class. And then next week, we won't meet on the Friday, of course, next week, because we'll meet on the Wednesday and Friday to keep, keep going with the lectures. So any questions that you have? Okay, great. Well, have a good day, and um, we will see you on uh, see you on Friday. This is Dr. Roger Green in his church history course on the Reformation to the present. This is lecture number one, the introduction, the syllabus. <laughs>